Okay, everyone, it's my pleasure to announce now Ansi Fresher with Compact Spaces and Privilege Time. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so, the title of this talk is uh, Compact Spaces and Privileged Times, um, but the subtitle is uh, What the Video Game Asteroids Can Teach Us About Presentism. Um, so, uh, it turns out that uh, this little guy, this little guy up here from this little triangle, um, he's the hero of this video game, Asteroids. Anyone here played Asteroids, like actually the original? Yeah, great. Um, so if this is a, does anyone not know what the game Asteroids is or how it works? A couple of people, all right, good. So uh, the video game Asteroids is an old school, like original video game. Um, and it turned out that this little guy here in the spaceship who runs around like shooting asteroids, lived in a really strange universe temporally. Um, so for uh, what's relevant to this talk is that this guy's universe is compact spatially. Um, so that means that if he goes off one side, he reappears on the other side, right? In any direction, he returns to his original, like sort of a, we identify both sides. We'll get more into the technicalities of it in a second. Um, but uh, this kind of topology has some really weird properties. Um, and I'm gonna use it here as a sort of a toy, fun, interesting example um, of talking through the dynamics of time in these kinds of universes um, and their implications for uh, sort of presentism in a relativistic context. Um, now, lest I be accused of this being very abstract and fun, toy, weird stuff, uh, it turns out our universe might be like the asteroids guy. Um, there's a bunch of stuff coming out in the last couple of years. We're talking about the idea that our universe could be spatially compact in at least one direction. Um, so it's an open question about whether or not our universe is like the asteroids one. Um, so all the stuff I'm going to talk about today, I'm sort of treating as an interesting example, but in the back of your minds, like have the idea that this could be the way our universe actually is. Okay, so uh, a brief overview. Um, I'm going to summarize presentism. Um, I'm going to like, talk about some common problems with presentism. We're all sort of aware of this in this room. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how spatially compact universes or SCUs um, seem to solve some of the problems that presentism experiences. Um, and then I'm going to, going to come to the conclusion that uh, SCU presentism has some problems itself. As a matter of fact, um, these kinds of systems may look really good for presentists, but in fact just highlight some of the fundamental problems that presentism has from a physics perspective. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go into depth with this. I sort of assume everyone in this new room knows the difference between presentism or eternalism. For the sake of this talk, I'm not going to distinguish between A theory, presentism, hence theories of time. They're all sort of the same thing as far as I'm concerned here and now. Obviously, there are differences when we get into the nuances, but for the sake of this, I'm just going to, when I say atheoretic or eternalist, uh, sorry, or presentist, I mean the same thing. Um, this is roughly that only present things exist in an ontologically privileged present. And this is in contrast to a B theoretic or eternalist or tenseless theory of time. Um, namely that we can't define a privilege present. There isn't something ontologically privileged about now. Okay, so um, presentism faces a very famous problem when it comes to relativity, right? This is Putnam, 1967. Um, and Putnam says, look, uh, given these three premises, we come to a problem for, premise, uh, for presentism. Um, basically said, look, uh, if I assume that the I now am real, and that at least one other observer is real, and it is possible for this other observer to be in motion relative to me, and if it is the case that all and only the things that stand in a certain relation are to me, where R is the uh, to real relation, um, and you now are also real, then it's also the case that all and only the things that stand in the relation R to you now are real, right? And so what this means is this famous diagram from Putnam, um, again, everyone in this room is sort of familiar with this objection to presentism that uh, if I take the things that are simultaneous with me to be real, um, that might include someone else who can be in the frame of reference. They have a different set of things that they're simultaneous with. And if uh, the realness uh, relation is transitive, then all the things they're simultaneous with this should also be real to me, which means that things in my future and my past seem like they should be simultaneous with me and in my present now. So we have a problem with presentism. Okay. So um, one of the ways it's been suggested to get around this problem for presentism is just to build an ontologically privileged present into your system. Just pick a frame of reference and have that one be your privileged now. 
Um, now, this runs into some obvious problems, been widely critiqued by numerous people in this room. Um, one of them couldn't be here today, Christy, um, but she says, look, uh, the dynamical thesis says that there is a metaphysically privileged hyperplane, but does not suggest that we have or could have any access to which hyperplane is privileged, and thus does not entail that a metaphysically privileged hyperplane is thereby physically or empirically privileged, right? Um, perhaps a little more succinctly, here's Craig, um, positing otherwise unnecessary, unobservable structure, absolute simultaneity, does a violence to Occam's race. So when we sort of posit this extra frame of reference, this special one, either we can't detect it or we can't interact with it, and if it's not present in our fundamental physics, we're basically just adding something in that doesn't seem necessary. And so why should we think it's fundamental or a part of our like fundamental physics? Okay, so. Um, here's my hypothesis, or like what I'm going to give you today. What if there was a way of finding that fundamentally privileged frame of reference? Um, and it turns out that closed flat space times will give that to you, or at least I'm going to suggest it looks like they do. Okay, so um, again, returning back to our little asteroids guy, this is the universe I'm talking about. Be a little more technical about it. Um, so, uh, times upwards, spaced across. Um, it's worth noting that I'm going to depict on my diagram with one spatial dimension, one temporal dimension. Um, everything I talk about should hold for higher spatial dimensions universe into their own. Um, it's just easier to diagramize things when it's one space, one time. Um, so, uh, little double arrows mean that I'm identifying the two sides of my universe. Um, so, if I go far enough in one direction, I return. Um, this is, uh, you can read this as a cylinder right, or a cylinder with no curvature. Um, if I flip one of those arrows, I get a toroid. Um, sorry, I get a uh, torus. Oh, sorry, what am I thinking of? Mobius strip. Thank you. Um, yeah, I get a Mobius strip. Um, okay, so uh, this is the universe I'm talking about. And I'm going to show you how we get something that looks like a privileged present by doing something really, really simple, like just identifying these two sides. Okay, so. Um, Here's uh, my observer in the dotted line, that'll be Alice, um, and she releases a light signal, right? Light signal travels off. Um, that doesn't affect my slides. Uh, light signal travels off in one direction and it returns back to her, right? Okay, so um, this has the interesting implication that you can tell whether you are static with respect to space time in a spatially compact universe. Why? Well, okay, if Alice is in red, and Bob's in blue. Um, and this little point down here, they both release these uh, light beams. Light beams go across. It looks like they bounce. They don't. They, in fact, like cross each other at the edge here, and they return. Now, Alice receives both of these light signals at the same time. Bob, on the other hand, receives one before the other. So that means that Alice now knows she is static with respect to the background space time, and Bob knows he is moving and how fast he's moving relative to the background space time. We've just broken symmetry. Right now, I can tell what frame I'm in. Okay, so as I said, this is further weirder implications. Um, so uh, here's Alice again. Uh, so let's identify the two sides of my universe: a naught naught and a naught lx, where lx is just the width of the universe that I'm measuring. Um, if uh, so, Alice sort of cross identifies these two things. Um, and we can run some calculations to see what Bob sees in this universe, right? So uh, Alice is this nice, like, this is a simultaneity plane, right? So there's the future, there's the past, there's Alice in the middle. We can run some calculations to see what Bob's seeing in this universe, basic Lorentz boosts, right? Uh, I'm just going to finagle it so that one side is the same for ease. But it turns out that while Bob and Alice will identify one sign of universe at the same point, Bob's going to see something different on the other side. Um, so he's going to see things boosted by this gamma factor, right? Um, and uh, gamma is always greater than or equal to a one. And so there's two implications. Um, one, uh, Bob sees the universe as wider than Alice. Um, his LX is going to be bigger. So Alice is the only observer that sees the universe as the narrowest it could possibly be. Everyone else's universe is what, like, blows out. And two, Bob's going to start getting these weird spiraling planes of simultaneity. Right, because he identifies one side here, he's got these little arrows here. He comes across and then it pops up and it keeps going. So for Bob, his planes of simultaneity spiral up the universe, whereas for Alice, they cut the universe in half. 
Um, here's the two of them on the same. So this is like, you can see that like Bob like skews slightly, which is through that uh, uh, Lorentz factor. Here's the two of them on the same sort of diagrammatic system. So here's more easy to see that like, I think I have to move my slides back as fast because we're cutting off so many things. But you can see when I diagramatize them together, right? Alice has this nice simultaneity plane, future past, and Bob has this weird thing that spirals upwards. So Bob is simultaneous with uh, his own birth back in the day, right? The beginning of the universe, uh, the founding of his asteroid fighting space team, right? He's also simultaneous with its eventual destruction. Oh. There we go. Yeah, it is, but it's just cutting off half my slides. I don't know what's going on. Um, that doesn't really match, I suppose, but. It's, it's on the screen as well. It's like shifted. So, yeah. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll manage through. Well, if I cut off words, you'll be able to see. Yeah. It's going to take much time. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah, just. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, look. So, uh, yeah. So, it's easy to see that like Alice and Bob have very different ideas of simultaneity in this universe. Right? Okay. So, uh, uh, one thing to note here is that while all this is very weird, uh, it is not the case that Alice has unique Cauchy surfaces. You might think that this weirdness somehow makes Alice very special when it comes to Cauchy surfaces. No, there are multiple possible ways to slice up our universe to make the um, our Cauchy surfaces work. It's not really that relevant to talk, but I figured I'd at least mention it because it's the last. Um, yeah, again, the diagram's gone. Um, causality is also totally standard in this universe, right? Remember it's uh, locally Minkowskian, it's just at the edges things get weird. Um, so if you could see this diagram, you'd see a bunch of light cones going up and down. And so light cones will loop, um, but uh, both Alice and Bob agree that the things in their future light cone and things in their past light cone are distinct, um, not in the diagram. Uh, and it's easy to see that like, they agree about the causal structure of the universe. There's nothing weird about that. Okay, so um, what does this mean? So if we look at uh, Alice's present, it's the only frame in this universe that has these properties, right? Everyone else who's moving relative to Alice, who's not in the static point, has spiraling frames of reference when it comes to simultaneity, right? Everyone else spirals, only Alice is static. Um, and that seems to imply that there's something interesting about Alice, that maybe she's somehow privileged and somehow finding this fundamental frame of reference. So um, this shows up in the literature. Um, if you look at compact space times, um, not many people go into this in depth, but it's like people just sort of in passing say, yeah, look, like here's a preferred time um, or here's a preferred class of inertial frames or uh, notions like absolute simultaneity and present can be consistently defined in the cylindrical space time, right? So this idea out there that like compact space times are really friendly to the idea of present. So uh, let's make this a little bit more uh, precise. Um, so here are all the properties that presentists might wish of their present. And some of you will disagree about this, but like here's some stuff that I think if you're a presentist, you're gonna want out of your privileged frame of reference. So you want your privileged frame of reference to be identifiable, right? I wanna be able to find it. Remember, this is the argument or the problem with it that like Calendar and Miller pull up, like I need to be able to find my frame of reference. Um, and you can do that in this system. Anyone can find the frame of reference. You've got enough time to bounce signals around the universe, you can locate your privileged frame. So split the universe into two regions, right? And again, Alice is the only one that splits the universe in half. For her, her place in deity gives future and past, and everyone else is these weird spiraling things that conflate future and past together. It's unique. Um, yeah, sorry about the text. Uh, if uh, time T1 is the present, then only time T1 is the present. I can just sort of stipulate that. Um, it's universal. Um, oh. <laughs> My times are changing. I'm gonna... Do I keep going? My present is, all right. Uh, it's universal. Uh, all of those will agree on what other events are are or are not in Alice's frame. Like everyone can figure out Alice's frame and will agree on what counts as simultaneous time. Right. 
Um, here's the big one. It's derivable from and compatible with general relativity or relativity. I'm talking about special right now. Um, that's a big one, right? There's a big argument against uh, presentism that stems from relativity in Putnam. And now it seems like I'm, I'm using Lorentz boost. I'm like shifting things back and forth. I'm deriving a privileged frame of reference using relativity, right? And that's, that's interesting, that's exciting. Um, Alice's plan simultaneity slices the entire space and generates both past and future states, right? She's a Cauchy surface. Uh, Bob's and anyone else's plan simultaneity are not Cauchy surfaces because they slice their own uh, lines multiple times. Um, and it's couched in fundamental physics vocabulary. This one's going to be important later when I talk about a different account of presence. Um, but uh, there's no averages. I've just found it. This is the frame of reference, right? Is it like this? Nope. Nope. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, okay, so uh, I found a privileged present, right? I've got all these magical properties, and it again, it's so easy. You just identify the two sides of your universes, and all of this drops out, right? Quick, easy, turns out all the atheist has to do is assume we live in a universe like the asteroids guy, and you've got presence done, yeah? Okay, so not so fast. Um, I'm not a presentist, so you should not be surprised that this is going to be a takedown of that idea. Um, but uh, there are a couple of really big problems. And again, the literature is not super critical of these things. So I'm going to talk through half of this is me talking about uh, what problems are present in the current literature on compact space times, and the rest of it's going to be me talking about these problems for broader presence. So uh, there are three big problems with the idea that SEUs get presence in the running. So um, the first problem is how we're defining simultaneity in these systems. This is the problem with the literature. Um, the second is the topology versus the phenomenal present. This is the broader problem that's been discussed by some other people. And the third one is the problem of abandoning Bob. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn. Okay, so um, defining simultaneity. So uh, papers that discuss compact space time, there are, there are a few of them, not a lot, but some that go into some depth with this. Um, Peters and Luminae, for example, uh, use radar synchrony or Einstein synchronization to build these special properties for Alice, right? How do we decide what Alice's point of simultaneity is? We use radar synchronization. Um, that involves, in the standard universe, like in our universe, we're not talking about compact space time, we're bouncing signals off of things, right? And then averaging out to figure out what our point of simultaneity is. Now, um, the good news is in a compact universe, you can get rid of the bounce. We no longer have to assume the two-way speed of light the one-way speed of light is constant because um, you can send signals to yourself. Um, the problem is that radar synchrony is not a good notion of simultaneity for this spacetime, or really any spacetime. Radar synchrony is nice, but it doesn't hold outside of special relativity. So um, here's Landau and Lifshitz. Uh, the only case in which synchronization of clocks is possible is that of a reference system in which all the quantities g naught alpha are zero. So what does this really mean? Well, um, this is in the general theory of relativity. So once we step up to GR over SR, we start to see problems with the derivation of Alice as something special. So um, there's a bunch of math in the background of this, but in general, uh, in GR, when we talk about simultaneity, we're using this equation up here, right? Where uh, delta x naught is the time difference between two points. Um, and so when delta x naught is zero, two points are simultaneous. Um, now, uh, the problem is that uh, delta x naught uh, is only, only really works when we're in static metrics. So special relativity, Minkowski, for example. Um, so uh, here's, here's the Minkowski metric. You can work out down here. So basically, if uh, this value here, g naught alpha is 0, then we're good to go. Um, but in a non-static metric, uh, it's entirely possible to show that something is not simultaneous with itself, right, via this transport of clocks. Um, so, I mean, this shouldn't be surprising. It turns out if you're trying to bounce signals off of things, when you throw a black hole or really any mass into the system, things are going to start warping and you're going to get weird answers for your simultaneity. 
Okay, so at a base level, when people talk about these, like, you know, Peters and Luminae and Lee talk about the idea that Alice is somehow privileged and special, they're really defining this in a special relativistic context. They're uh, not doing that in GR, which is what really we ought to be working on. Okay, so uh, we can be charitable here. Um, we can assume the asteroid universe is destroyed, this devoid of asteroids. There's no mass in it, no curvature. Um, so under limited circumstances, maybe Alice's frame is somehow special and there's like the Minkowski system. Um, it's also possible there are other ways of defining simultaneity that could work for the system, for example, Malamut simultaneity. Um, you might be able to get around this in some other way by not using radar synchronization, but um, let's, let's set that aside for one moment. It's like a problem with the way that we're building these systems rather than a problem with the system itself. Okay, so uh, here's a second problem. What about the topology of the phenomenology? Um, so uh, here's another question you might have about this universe. Uh, one thing that uh, presentists really want out of these kinds of systems is the notion of temporal passage and flow, right? Um, so uh, how, we might ask, does Alice's frame of reference give us the idea of a flowing time? Um, and how does this topology ground that phenomenon? Um, so, uh, wrong ordering thing, sorry. So uh, basically it's unclear how broad scale properties of topology are supposed to ground a present for Alice, Bob, or anyone else in the system. Remember that uh, the compact space then is locally exactly like our universe. Um, so you might wonder what is it about some fact about the matter, you know, way out there in the universe that reaches in and tells me right here, right now that I'm in the present, right? Um, and so, uh, it seems odd to rely on a property of global topology when it comes to uh, grounding these kinds of presence. Okay, um, this is also a problem for non-compact universes. Um, so you might wonder if we do want to posit this like uh, phenomenal, uh, sorry, uh, ontologically privileged frame, how does it reach in and tell everyone what's that they're the ones in the present, right? Where does this communication happen? How do you use coordination? Okay. Um, and finally, I think this is the most interesting objection. Um, we might argue that these kinds of systems, and this is more broad than just SU topologies, um, we're just abandoning everyone except Alice, right? Um, so uh, Bob's a real human being with real experiences and real ideas of how his world works and what his local system looks like and what he's simultaneous with. And it seems like in uh, an SU universe or any universe where we posit a privileged frame of reference, we're just saying, nah, Bob's got nothing important to say here. Bob's irrelevant. Every measurement he makes, every experience he has, totally irrelevant. He's got to go to Alice to figure out what the present is and what he's simultaneous with. Um, and it seems worrying that we're sort of slaving Bob to Alice in this kind of way, Bob and everyone else, right? Alice is someone takes this privileged position. Um, and yet Bob's got equally viable measurements, right? Like why should we think that Bob has nothing to say about these things? Uh, this I think is a kind of hard to grasp objection a little bit. Um, so, uh, I think, um, hold on, where am I? Uh, yeah, you're abandoning the idea that being present is transitive, um, and you're abandoning the idea that Bob has anything to say about what the present counts as. Um, so I think this is easy to see when we do a comparison to another concept of presentism, cosmic time. Cosmic time has its own set of problems, um, but it does have a couple of benefits over the idea of picking a privileged frame as your like fundamental uh, present. So um, I'm gonna use Swinburne's cosmic time just to look nice, um, but Swinburne uh, posits cosmic time, right? Because there is a unique instant, a unique plane of simultaneity by all the clocks and all the frames at which the expansion of the universe began. Given the principle of similar clocks, an observer on each galaxy can retrodict how many years ago by his clocks this early instant occurred and his present instant will be simultaneous absolutely with the instant on the clock of each other galaxy when an observer on that galaxy judges the same number of years has elapsed since that early instant. Very abstract, this diagram. So the idea of cosmic time is roughly this. Um, trace everyone back to the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, like microseconds after the Big Bang happens and give everyone a stopwatch clock. Um, and theoretically everyone's close enough that you can just pass them out right, just by slow transport, you can give everyone clocks and you won't change the timing on those clocks too much. Um, and now you let everyone go on their merry way. Um, 
And then you ask, uh, when's the present? And you say, well, um, on my clock, it says, you know, 14.3 billion years and 21 days. Um, and I am simultaneous. The present is also wherever someone else is also reading that number on their clock, right? Um, and so this is supposed to be a way of getting around the idea of general relativity, so objection to special relativity, oh, sorry, to presentism. Um, and so you end up with these like clocks is very odd present, but everyone sort of agrees. Um, now, uh, here's the nice thing about cosmic time. I have a present and you guys have a present and the people in like Madrid have a present and the people in Alpha Centauri have a present. And all of us can access that present. We know what it is, we can figure it out. We are deciding and a part of the physical present as it happens, right? I'm not looking to someone else in the universe to tell me when the now is. Um, so it's a, for want of a better word, like a democratic equal access version of the present, right? And that's beneficial. I want my physics to be grounded in my experiences, not just someone else somewhere telling me what my simultaneity plane should look like and what now is. Um, this is in contrast to cause uh, SCU time, right? Where I am just slaving everyone to the one person. Now, again, cosmic time has some problems. They're well known. Um, there are uh, a lot of questions about who gets the clock. Is it atoms? Is it people? Is it galaxies, right? And some weird statistical stuff. Gödel hated the theory uh, of position, but um, it's uh, basically uh, cosmic time for all of its problems has some benefits, right? Okay, so in conclusion, um, spatially compact universes are in many ways an ideal system for a present kind of time, where they look really nice. And again, very easy to build, um, but they come with their own spate of problems, ones that make them much less attractive than they first seem. So in particular, SEU time fails to play the time role for all relevant observers. And this is a problem that's not just uh, held to SEU times, but it's a problem for presentism in general. It's got to explain how it plays the time role for everyone. Um, so, as I said, this is an inherent training system which claims to be able to locate a single metaphysical equivalent of foliation. Um, and it poses problems for not just standard presentism, but for any physics series which calls for privileged frames of reference. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, stuff I thought a, a bit about as well. So, um, I was wondering why you think there's like Bob is not being treated fairly. So it seems like he can perfectly well using his own equipment also discover the preferred frame. Um, he can just also realize he's not in it. And um, it seems to me that uh, he is gonna be, like he can realize he's moving relative to the preferred frame. So you might worry about the phenomenal problem, but it doesn't, I guess I just wasn't as persuaded by this like fairness or like measuring uniqueness problem. And then I had a, quick follow-up about whether or not in the kind of global case, the second one you described for general relativity, it seems that you could end up with people with their own clocks who are in the past or future light cone when they're simultaneous in a way that you don't get with special relativity. And I was just wondering if you could comment more about that. I mean, that seems to me to be a really bad problem. Sorry, was that the last one? Was that for the cosmic time case? Yeah, yes. okay. the cosmic time. Yeah, like somebody goes and hangs out near a black hole for a while and then comes back. And yeah, look, I I don't want to defend cosmic time. Like, I think that's a problem. I agree with you. I think there's like some issues for cosmic time for exactly those reasons. Because like you end up with these weird like odd surfaces that sort of are somehow supposed to be the present. The the idea is that like not the cosmic time is a better alternative per se, but that it has some strengths. And like those strengths seem like reasons that like help highlight why there are weaknesses in it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just like, it seems to me the balance was definitely in favor of the special relativistic one rather than the cosmic time. But that's, I don't necessarily disagree with they're that. They're both bad. But I think it's well, <laughs> it's important to note that like they do have different strengths. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. The, you can see the different strengths relative to each other easily, I think. Um, and sorry, your story was about slaving Bob to everyone else and why that was bad. Um, yeah. So look, uh, I just think there's a problem if like it turns out that what all of us think is simultaneous is not simultaneous. I think that you and I are simultaneous, right? And it's kind of worrying if someone comes along and says, no, not at all, right? Like it turns out the frame is like way out there somewhere and it's moving really fast relative to us. And you and I are just not the kinds of thing, like it's just not the case that you and I are simultaneous in that kind of way. Um, matter of fact, I think it'd be really weird 
if that turned out to be the case. And I think there was something worrying about that kind of system because like now I seems like I just have nothing to say about what the present is. Like I'm just, I'm irrelevant now. I just have to spend all of my time asking someone way out there what they think is the now, right? And like, that seems worrying to me. Like that I have to figure out from someone else's perspective what counts as now. Like I don't have any ability to even comment on what counts as now other than like, I must be now relative to them, but I have no idea about the rest of the world. Um, that just seems worrying to me in ways that like, I kind of want to say that like all of us exist in the now and should have some relation to the now beyond querying someone else and maybe so far away we can never ask questions of them and work out what the now is. Thank you very much. Um, I want to know how deep your anti-presentism runs. <laughs> uh, so something that you were saying before, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that Alice's uh, frame of reference doesn't explain the phenomenology of temporal flow, and then you were saying this is even going to be a problem for a non-compact universe, because how does a space-time point know it's present? Would you also think that the same problem is going to apply in a non-relativistic universe? Um. Because I think the answer is yes. Can, can you say more? I, just if you think the issue is about how does a space-time point know it's present, you know, that seems to me to be an objection independent of relativity. That seems fair to me. Yeah, if I'm taking that to be an objection to presentism, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think in many ways, it's one of the nice things about this kind of toy system is that you can see these problems emerge and then realize it's not actually tied to this issue. It just makes it really salient that these kinds of worries are around. Um, so, yeah, I think that seems, I, I agree with you, like, Fantastic. basically. Like, Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so I kind of think um, Heather's shot my fox a bit because it's the, the slaving Bob problem, but I wanted to have another go at, at, at framing it, I suppose. So Bob isn't confused about when Bob is, right? Like, just look in the mirror. Ah, oh, look, there I am. Um, but so the problem is working out who's simultaneous with Bob. And we're, we're currently in a worse position than Bob in that we don't have a clue who's simultaneous with us. Bob is much better than us in that it's possible for Bob to answer this. This seems like progress for Bob. You, you're claiming that this is a terrible feature of the theory, that Bob has this possibility, which none of us currently have. And you're presenting it as if Bob isn't sure when Bob it, but Bob, that's, Bob's got the same evidence we have for that, right? Um, of just sort of, you know, looking at his watch or whatever. Uh, we just don't know how to calibrate that with Alice, but Bob still seems better off than any of us in this room. Like we, if, if that's slavery, let us all be slaves. Yeah, I mean, so you might see, I guess, the strength of like for Bob's position is that like, you know, yeah, at least he knows that there's a privileged president out there and he can figure out what's doing. I mean, we're making some assumptions about Bob and that he lives in a universe that's like small enough, for example, he can make these measurements in real time, like a reasonable time frame, for example. Um, but uh, it still seems worrying to me that Bob has to just throw up his hands and be like, I guess Alice is just magic. She's a special one. She gets to determine the now, right? And like, uh, when I think about physics, I don't want my physics to be the kind of thing where I have to turn to someone else, figure this thing out, and then pull it back to my frame. Like I want, maybe I'm just showing my biases here. I want all my frames to be equally represented, right? I want everyone to be a part of the fundamental physics. And it feels worrying to me when like one person gets to dictate fundamental physics, like arguably some of the most fundamental of physics. What is now, right? From an A theory perspective, like it seems worrying to me when Bob just doesn't even get to have a, any say in that, right? I want to say that his frame is somehow just as important as Alice's. And so I've, I've yet to see something in this that indicates that Alice really is something more fundamentally special just because she's got these like weird properties. So uh, I also was not particularly moved by most of these objections to the <laughs> SU, but but and, and following up on that, it, it seems like then you, you just can't have local special relativistic space-time structure. And you, you would never be happy with that because we all know what happens with the, the local differential effects and, and and so there's there's just no way to satisfy the, the, the things you want except in a Newtonian type uh, universe it seems to me but but my actual question was if you could say something about the case where you, you throw in some actual asteroids and gravity 
because the, the, the nice story where we, we know exactly what Alice's frame is and, and everything, the procedure just works in empty special relativistic space, is what happens when you put in some matter that now you don't get any um, well-defined simultaneity planes, or is it that you have multiple choices, or is it just that it's kind of bumpy? I was just wondering what happens. I mean, the answer is, um, let me see if I can move back to the, uh, uh, so um, if you throw matter into this universe, right, so how am I calculating this like dotted line here? I'm using Einstein synchronization and radio synchronization, right? Which means I'm sort of bouncing, but in this case, I'm passing it around. But if I stick a black hole to the left here, right, what happens is that thing curves. And the moment it curves, suddenly I'm not, it's not identifying, something's not crossing my space, it'll cross at a different point. And now suddenly I've got something that crosses at two points of analysis and will start spiraling, right? The moment you get any curvature here, the whole thing starts spiraling upwards or downwards, right? And so uh, throwing mass in basically means you don't get these nice structures. Um, yeah, you're like, uh, your measured plane system of via radar synchronization no longer are flat. Right, so it's, it's, but it's not just a matter of um, determination, like the, it, it, talking about radar synchronization sounds like a practical problem between two, two separated people, but here the issue is whether there's even a well-defined foliation, right? Yeah, right. yes. Um, and again, radar synchrony is like, it's a convention, I can choose other ones, but like, this is the one that everyone uses in the space, and it's just very unclear to me that this actually holds anything beyond like these empty universes. So if you're trying to say Alice is special, you can't hinge that special vessel on a property that just doesn't instantiate in almost any universe. Right? Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I just wondered a bit like some of the others whether at least some of your objections could be softened slightly by maybe distinguishing some of the views you were running together, the presentism and the tensor theory, you know, uh, the A theory. So what do you think about this? But it, it, the two objections that struck me as maybe softenable uh, were the worry that uh, about how we, how, how a point knows it's present, how we know we're present, the sort of, um, the effect that the present has as it were, in terms of sort of epistemic access and stuff like that. And then the, maybe the Bob slaving to Alice thing as well. So if, if you had a, a view of a kind, of, if you liked a kind of A theory according to which you have a manifold and you have a present, but then you also add that, and let's suppose it's cylindrical, uh, and then you add that the only thought that goes on is thought relative to the present moment, and the only uh, knowledge that there is is knowledge, of, and so on and so forth. So you, it were by definition, strip the people outside the plane of simultaneity, assuming that's the present moment, from you know, they're, they're there, they're out there somewhere, but they're not doing anything particularly interesting. They've, just, they've gone really boring. Uh, in virtue of not being present. So all the ordinary things we're interested in, in other words, are tagged on to presence. Then I think, I don't know, maybe it's worth thinking about at least, I'm not going to try and develop the idea, but it's worth thinking about whether some of these objections look as, as awful because, you know, conversation we might have about, oh, are we present or is the, well, if we're thinking, <laughs> if we're having a conversation, we're definitely both present. Um, Oh, well, maybe some people think they're thinking and think they're having conversations, but they're not really. And that's a kind of tragedy too, I guess, for them. <laughs> but uh, it's a different, it's a slightly different kind of tragedy. Uh, it's a bit like when you think you know something and it turns out you didn't know it. You thought Lance Armstrong won the, won the Tour de France. And, you know, it feels bad in retrospect. It's not good knowing that. Does, yeah. that, make, does, that, does that kind of make sense? I, I think I get where you're coming from. So um, I think, the analogy I'm trying to draw here is something like, look, uh, in, in this universe, um, knowing what is now relies on a large scale topological feature of the universe, right? Like it, it just, you have to have this like connectedness in order to 
to be able to define what the now is. Um, and it seems worrying to me that that's the case, because how does a particular point in space time know where it is relative to broad scale structure? Like, does the structure reach in and like sort of grab things and say, here's the now? Like, how do you figure that out? Um, I think that's analogous to sort of some of the worries in the non-compact space that you're bringing up, right? Like, how do I know I'm the now? Well, I'm thinking, I'm acting, great. But how does that bit of you know that it has to instantiate the now now, right? And so there's these broad scale structures of the simultaneity plane, but like how this structure like holds together and tells all these bits and pieces that it needs to be doing the now is difficult, right? Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to argue that. And like, you know, there's some parts of like physics that you might maybe have to sort of run something, but like that seems worrying to me, like these broad scale structures um, somehow dictating what the now is. So, um, I think this is now a kind of a just brief follow up on, you know, Bob. Um, I, I wonder, so the way I heard it was that you thought the phenomenology objection was kind of, you know, been there, done that. And the equality one was kind of separate from that. I, I guess I'm wondering if it's really as separate as you think, because, I mean, um, when you say, you know, we should all be kind of in an equal position to access, I think you said like kind of the fundamental physical facts. I'm not sure this is a fundamental physical fact, even on that view, like really, you know, I, I think really um, what you're pushing for Bob there is kind of related to what, you know, what atheists are saying when they say there should be I don't know, experiential access and that's going to be first personal in some sense, you know, that's always, that, that was always a kind of impulse. And so that's why, you know, there shouldn't be any deferring. It, it shouldn't be something, uh, yeah, that you find out through other people because of that. Yeah, look, I, so I think in many ways, when I, I, th I think you're, you're right, there's something important about acknowledging that, I think, uh, gonna, yeah, hold on. when I put up this list of things the presidents wanted, I'm sure a lot of presidents in this room were like, whoa, hold up, there's a bunch of other things I want or things that I don't want on this list. Um, but, uh, so one of them, and I had another slide earlier on that I, somehow deleted on this copy where I added a last one on the bottom where I was like, also equal access. That seems like a thing you might want as a presentist, right? And so like, I agree with you. I think that like the idea that like, maybe what you want in your presentism is this sort of like equal access phenomenological like uh, ability to be a part of the flow of time and everyone should have that. Um, and so perhaps you could read this less as like a takedown of presentism and more like a takedown of this particular type of presentism because you need that last one. And that's kind of what you want out of these systems. Um, and so that means that like, you're just not gonna like the Alice style or the, the SCU style present because you're gonna want that extra thing, right? So like where uh, you might add an extra one here, equal access time, and that's the one that like SCU time fails on. And then we've got this like couched in fundamental physics vocabulary, which is where the co uh, Swinburne uh, cosmic time fails, right? So one, each of them fails on one of these, but, um, and then it's up to you which one you think is more important which kind of type of presentism you're going to get on board with. I mean, I don't think either presentism runs, so I'm, I'm going to be neutral on that one. I think, I mean, I'm sort of sympathetic to the idea that like this one just seems like a nicer version of presentism than the cosmic time, but I also want to acknowledge that cosmic time has strengths that this one doesn't match. And so like, I think you're just going to start deciding which one you think is like, which of these bullets you're gonna buy and which ones you're gonna run with. And like, obviously there are other types of presentism around the place other than these two, um, but it's worth comparing them. I think it's easy to see these contrasting differences. I think I have a very naive question. Um, so the, the, the crux of the question is Alice being different than everyone else, Alice is stuck with Alice. There's an additional step you have to say that she's right, right, like that she got right. So. Is it, I'm putting aside Carl's worry that once you start getting stuff in the universe, everything is weird. That Alice's is not weird like everyone else's, then is supposed to ground, and maybe this is just my an issue I have with presentation in general, it's supposed to ground the, that it's the right one, that it's, that it's getting it right. Yeah. What, what makes what allows you to make that move from that it's different and it's nice and tidy and clean to that it is kind of the right one. Yeah, good. So I'm sort of basing it off of this list sort of thing, right? Because Alice is the only one that meets all these criteria. Um, any other frame of reference in the universe is going to not have these properties, right? And so if you're trying to build a nice privileged present, 
um, and uh, you're presentist and you're going around, you're like, look, like, I think I really want to have a privileged frame. That's what I'm going for in my presentism. Um, now I need to figure out what that looks like. In our universe, it's really hard to pick one, like notoriously, like there's very few reasons to pick one over any other. But in Alice's universe, it turns out that you've just got this one frame that really is different than everyone else, right? And it's got all these nice properties that make it the sort of thing that you think might be a good candidate for your presence, right? And so if you're gonna pick a frame of reference, you're pretty much guaranteed to pick Alice in this universe over anyone else because of those properties. Thanks, NCA. I liked your uh, talk. Um, got me thinking about a bunch of things, which is uh, good. Um, yeah, I, I think the uh, the issue that I would have would probably be number four, universal. Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, Alice sending a message to Bob saying, Bob, stop living in the past. And uh, um, Bob just responding, you know, uh, you're, you're not any better, you're just older. Um, I think we're talking about proper time um, being uh, um, uh, taking taking the place of of uh, of uh, the uh, uh, the real uh, experience of what um, the uh, um, the the present is supposed to bring. So I think Bob is going to, you know, if it, he'll probably say, if I'm if if I'm wrong, I don't want to be right. This is the present, and uh, um, uh, so the idea of even uh, like who would be who who would be in a position to say that Bob is wrong. You know, that's uh, that's uh, that's where I, I I think there's there you, you might say okay, well this is this is d defined by light hitting in a particular way, and that's fair enough. But I think that that uh, that would be a good statement about uh, about proper time. But uh, um, the uh, the f uh, present has to uh, be in some sense congruent with the f uh, with the phenomena of uh of uh of uh of the present so i think uh, um if if we look at uh bob uh yeah you you're, you're right I, no one would bob would not agree that um with what is alice's present uh he would say that probably uh um there was some some point earlier that uh that they were uh in, or um they there is some kind of in, incongruency that they are un, 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 unaware of, but uh, I think that uh, um, so I, I don't know if I've made myself clear, but I'm thinking that there's uh, that phenomenal present has to be um, a sort of like a bedrock of of what is what the present is is using the present for. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. So is this something to do with like number four universal? Yeah. Right. So the idea is that everyone will. Ag like everyone in the universe agrees on what Alice is experiencing and what Alice is now yeah, is. Yeah, I think there may be the, well, the present is Well, I think so. I've, I've included Universal partially because um, I think it's a if you're going to build this now into the universe, I personally, if I'm presentist, I'm, I would like to have that now be one that everyone can locate, right? And that everyone agrees on what the now is. Um, not not personally, but like I can find so if I whatever the now is, I want to be able to at least say that I can point at it, right? That's the now. This is the now. They're now, right? Okay. And so like um, the idea of the Universal is just that look. Uh, everyone ought to be able, like, in an ideal world of presentism, everyone ought to be able to find that and agree on it, right? We all agree on what the now is. Like, it seems to be worrying, or like, it's a worse form of presentism if you just acknowledge that no one's going to know what the now is, how to access it, or where it is, and what to do with it, right? Um, you want something that everyone can figure out where it is. And that's one of the nice things about SC Universe is like, given enough time to bounce things, everyone might. Have their own phenomenal experience in the now, which I worry about. But at least everyone will agree what Alice is, what the static position of the universe is, and what her simultaneity plane is, right? Under a basic SCU concept. Does that? Yeah, I think that's basically. Yeah, I think that's 
Okay, cool. So you don't think that's an important aspect of yeah. presentism? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have a feeling we're disagreeing about so some like language complexity going on here. Um, but let's let's talk later about like the universe thing. I think yeah, I want to hear more about this. Okay, um, I normally would have a question, but I don't think we have time anymore. I'll ask you later. Thank you so much for having me.